I'm Don Holmes. I'm a member of the Petersburg Marine Mammal Center. Um, and part of our mission statement, if you will, education, support of researchers, and uh, stranding, that is to say, entanglements, dead, dying marine mammals. Um, I first met Ed Lyman about 12 years ago, 12 years ago, 2005. Uh, when he first came to the West Coast and started introducing the process of how do you systematically go about trying to disentangle a, a large mammal that's been uh, caught in something, whatever that something happens to be. And uh, a lot of good information that he brought from the East Coast, which is where a lot of the techniques were originally developed. Um, since then, uh, we, and subsequently, a year later, we had a chance to uh, put this learning into effect right out here at uh, Frederick Point when a whale became uh, entangled in a uh, working gill net. And we, with the help of uh, three young men in the, in the Coast Guard who were, who were called, called up to, to come investigate what we were doing, um, we were able to successfully uh, disentangle a, a very large animal that was firmly wound up in a gill net. So the training worked well, uh, and uh, subsequent to that, a lot of new techniques have been introduced. We invite, this is its third time back in Petersburg as uh, helping us do what we, we try to do, and so I will leave it to him. You're thanking me, and, and I'm thanking you guys. And, and, and beyond Don and Barry and Sonny and the, and the, the response team there and some new members there, um, it's the whole community. And, that, and that, it's not just Petersburg. It's Sitka, it's Wrangell, you, and you get the idea. I won't list every community. But it's the community effort of working together. Because your government agencies, whether it's state or federal, are not going to be able to pull this off by, the, by themselves. They don't have the expertise. Uh, I'm not a fisherman by any means. I don't bring that type of expertise to the table. I'm more of a, a biologist. I had some whale experience. So I, that was where I stepped in. I did work with fishermen, and I learned right away that whether it was fishermen, well, your professional mariners, the whale biologists, and the fishermen were the three components you needed for this type of effort that I want to tell you about today. Whale response. It takes that those type of people and the community at large to pull it off. And by the way, Don, um, one of the Coast Guard guys you trained went down to Maui and was stationed at Station Maui. So uh, I had you trained one of my uh, guys, so to speak, and thank you very much. And that. So it's a lot of sharing of information. And over the years, I've realized on many um, avenues or paths that, again, it takes a different expertise. And one of those was fishing, fishermen, fishing gear, fishing techniques. So even today, someone said, about uh, you know, fishing license have the incidental take, and they said, "What do you guys have? What do I have as a as a responder?" Well, we have our permit. We work under a permit. That's our incidental take. That's our fishing license to catch a whale in order to release it. So that's what I want to tell you about, and then we'll get into um, a little bit of this catch and release. A little again, a play on words, but whale entanglement response, large whale entanglement response. We don't say disentanglement any longer. Because it's not about trying to save every whale. We've learned that lesson. It took us a while. It took us about a decade to figure out that you're not solving the problem by trying to cut whales free. Um, you need to get figure out what's going on. And the nice thing about that is it's broad-based. Yeah, no problem saving a whale if you can, if it's a life threatening entanglement. But there's other um, issues, other impacts here to the public. People, we've seen people want to jump in the water with a knife between the teeth to save a whale. People care about these animals. We don't want that to happen. You've got, uh, it's fishing gear, it's not always fishing gear, but when it is, you don't want to see the loss of gear or a fisherman lose his or her life in the process of trying to get their boat free or help the whale in the process, things like that. So it's very broad based in that regard. And again, I'm gonna fill you in on more on how this, this catch and release works. Um, but um, first thing is well, why do we have to catch them in the first place, and the reason being is they're large whales, you know, a humpback whale, 40 tons, 45 feet, maybe up to 50 feet long. They tend to, whatever it is, they drag it off the ocean floor. Not all the time, depends on the gear, what you're talking about, and the health of the animal, but a lot of times they drag it off the ocean floor and swim off with it. Okay, so now that's the basis of the catch part here 
on the, on the um, response side. Okay, so again, there's one animal there, and then here's the the release part of it. Okay, so um, let me show you some again teaser video. That's a, a yearling humpback whale. Looks like the sharks took their liberties once it was initially entangled. So it took some bites out of the tail, but there's coming up and a couple cuts right there. So by no means is that that's not easy. That took a good health person, took a lucky accommodating whale to a certain degree, and some good pole work there. Sort of like your sword fisherman there or harpooning. So and another uh, view. Again, it can be uh, very difficult to be challenging. It's, uh, it's going to be wide to uh, another yearling there. So you can see pole work, you know, we have our own fishing poles of sorts. Almost lost that one. So, and it looks like a, looks like some uh, long line, some uh, sort of subtropical long line for tuna in this case. Let's keep going. And then dangers too, and I'm just going to take you back in time. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson on whale response here. It's a, Two very important people on the boat there, Dave Matilla and Stormy Mayo, they're kind of the pioneers for some of this large whale rescue work. I'm in the middle. I'm, that's my apprenticeship that I'm learning right there. So I think that was like my third or fourth one that I actually got in the boat with them. I was just a boat captain, and one day they pulled me in. I was just hired to be the boat captain. So um, that's a North Atlantic white whale. Only about 300 of them left at the same time. They took a swing at us, didn't hit us. That is the moment, by the way, that we learned that we wanted flying knives, knives that come off poles. Um, a little more remote fishing, if you will, in that regard. So, but it can be dangerous. And again, right away, I want to introduce maybe next slide here, but uh, the input of fishermen. Fishermen. Um, since, you know, people, I know when I'm talking to the media, everyone goes, it's always fishing here. It's not always fishing here. That is not the case. So it's not, that's not always a problem side, there's a positive side here. In fact, the positive side is much larger. The help of the fishermen. And I'm going to take you back, because I got my little, it's, I found this little book in the picture there, and I thought it was perfect. Um, this all started with fishermen. The first disentanglers were fishermen. And, and back in those days, I think let's go to the next slide, I think I, yeah. Back in those days, the gear wasn't as strong, it wasn't, it was more the natural fiber stuff, and the breaking strengths were down a little lower. By the way, fewer whales, too, so that's part of the equation. And the whales are breaking through this stuff, and if it was complex stuff, like, uh, I don't know, things like uh, cod traps and weirs, then the whales were getting caught. And for the most part, they were avoiding it, but then in the 70s, we had a big episode on the East Coast where a bunch of humpback whales came in close to shore. They had been staying offshore, but the capelin, their bait fish, moved in, and the cod fishing was happening along the shore with weirs, and the two overlapped. And it was new for the fishermen, it was, the whales were new for the fishermen, the gear was new for the whales, and we had massive number of entanglements occurring, entrapments and entanglements, and the fishing industry, again, they had been the first disentanglers. Whale biologists weren't even touching whales at this point, and there wasn't very many reports. The fishermen went to their local, their local university to try to find a biologist, and there was no whale biologist back then in the 70s, and they found a, a psych uh, professor, psychology professor, named John Lean. Poor guy, he was at the wrong place, wrong time. He worked with fishermen, he learned whales. They cut free probably around 850 whales. I'm gonna give you a number here. The overall number we think have been cut free through a formal network effort. Now, not counting what fishermen have done, okay? But the formal network effort, around 1,400 animals. But that guy and a group of fishermen did 850 of them uh, off of Newfoundland in their short summer, okay? That's saying something. So I, I learned that lesson, and now Wayne Ledwell took over from John Lean, and I, I'm following the footsteps. I, I would very much like to work with fishermen because that's the equation. So there's John Lean, by the way. All his knives were on hockey sticks. God bless him. He had different hockey sticks. He's a Canadian, so he had his <laughs> hockey sticks with different knives, and he had just simple knives. Um, so, and then here's what happened next, you know, a little history lesson here. Right whale started getting entangled. And the gear got stronger, by the way, so things are changing. We're getting into the poly blends and the different synthetic lines, the breaking strengths are going up. And some of the gears getting to a point where, where hydraulics are coming in more and you can lift the gear up off the ocean floor. So whales are getting caught in gear they can drag away with them, but they're still able to, to drag it with them. They're big too. And we're getting more mobile entanglements, so to speak. Again, taking part of the gear with them. That's a right whale. 
and they and that whale drove the response effort. Okay, but it was very much focused on the animal. And I just forgot something. In the early days with the fishermen in Canada, it was saved by gear. It wasn't they? They went to John not to save the whale, but to save the gear. Okay. Then when right whales came along, it switched over to save the whale. Remember, now it's getting the 80s and the 90s. So things are starting to change. And it was all save whale, save whale. And when you only had 300 of them left on the species, there was some value in that, at least right whales. Okay, there's the uh, Stormy May on the left, David Mattel on the right, again, the pioneers. And they started this mobile effort. It was Stormy's dad, when, when they started getting um, entangled right whales down in Cape Cod Bay, Stormy's dad was a tuna fisherman, a bluefin tuna fisherman, and he would keg his tuna. When you get a 500 pound tuna on the line, you keg it, you put a, a barrel, or in this case it was the poly balls, the Norwegian buoys, on the tuna, slow them down, keep it to the surface. Okay? His dad, Stormy, said, that's what you need to do with the whales. And he goes, here we are, New Bedford's over there, New Tuckett's here, that's also a whaling technique. That's how the whalers used to deal with their big, you know, with the 40 ton animals, the sperm whales, and, and the right whales back then. So basically they started a technique of, of slowing down and keeping these large whales to the surface, um, the kegging technique, and again, which is a modification of an old whaling technique, which I would argue is sort of fishing too in, in a different way. So, okay, oh, that's us back in the early days. So I want to also uh, give you a little background on the impact here. Um, and those can be at the individual level. Uh, you've got physical trauma, lines cutting through the flesh. You might have an uh, inability to maneuver, right? That's a ship term, a nautical term. You're dragging a bunch of gear behind you, then you get hit by a boat, things like that. Uh, systemic infections. Uh, starvation is a big one for a large whale, and it takes a long time for it to happen, okay? So it might take quite a while. Uh, and every once in a while, the, the attempts are so complex, and we especially see this with young animals they might actually drown the gear. So things like juveniles and calves. Okay. And then there's impacts again. This is, we've learned our lesson. It's much broader. It's not just animal side, it's human side, whether it's public or the fishing industry side. So and there are impacts of that injury, loss of life, loss of gear, a catch, things of that nature, bad perception. No one wants to catch a whale. So there's that. And of course, if you catch enough, your fishing license might say, well, instead I'll take it, it's a cost of doing business. But if there's enough there, then regulations might come down the pipe. Don't want that necessarily. I got two images there. Actually, the lower one's a state same boat doing sampling. They ended up catching a humpback whale. This is a Prince William Sound area. And then the upper image is a finback whale, 62 foot finback whale. Fishing boat came in from a day of fishing. This is on the north side of Kodiak. And they're anchored, they're eating breakfast. Uh, they're all in the galley, they're anchored, so no problem. And all of a sudden, the boat starts lurching and starts moving, and they run to the bow to see what's going on, and this finback whale, a juvenile finback whale at 62 feet, had grabbed their anchor line, chain and all cable, in its mouth, and had panicked and wrapped up, very typical juvenile, made a mistake, wrapped up, death throws now, because it can't hold its breath forever, you know, maybe, I don't know, finbacks, maybe 40 minutes, um, but it panics and drags that 65 foot boat along and actually put the bow of the boat underwater a couple times. Scared, spooked the guys bad. And I think they told me 14 foot uh, freeboard at the bow of that boat. Um, so they were able to undog the winch and they, I think they cut the cable. They, they were all okay. Whale did not survive. It made the mistake and panicked and twirled up and drowned in the gear. So impacts on all sides is the message. And impacts at population level. Um, just a humpback whale. This one was cut free. But obviously, at the individual level, it affects the population. Into the magnitude of threat is, you get the reports of these, that's one side of it, okay? So you actually see an entangled whale, but then there's a hint of what's going on by the scar analysis. So you look at whales, and you'll see if they have scars on their body, and whether it's a ship strike or entanglement scar. And we've, wherever we've looked, we've always found entanglement scars on them, so it's pervasive. And the, and the ratio tends to be anything from about 30% up to about 85% actually is the new high level for right whales in the North Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so it, it's a fairly big threat. But here's the flip side. When you're looking at scars, guess what? Those animals have thrown the gear. We're not saving that many whales. So a lot of whales get in gear 
uh, long enough to leave a mark and then throw the gear on their own. Okay, so that's that's good bad news, good news kind of thing. So I want you to keep that in perspective as well. And there's some examples there on the right. And then here's our reporting level. I mean, so this is the last of reports over the last decade or so. These are confirmed cases that people saw the whale and reported it to us, to a network effort. Those numbers are quite small. Now, we know they're underestimates. We know that there's more than that out there. But these are the animals that we know about and that we have a chance to respond to. Here's my mother calf just pointing out that at the population level two, we have seen that mothers that are, have been entangled have fewer calves. Uh, usually the interval is a little greater. And I, didn't, I wanted to show a pretty picture here at some point as well. So all the entanglement stuff and wounds and everything like that. So, Okay, I slipped this in there on top though to point out that, and you guys know this, is that least bull humpback whales and gray whales, for many species of whales, many populations, the impact, whether it's ship strike or entanglement we're talking about here, is not overt in this in the sense that it's not negatively affecting the population. The population, many of them, is still growing. So for like humpback whales, most of the humpback whales out there, which are part of the central North Pacific stock, they're increasing, they're recovering. Maybe they have recovered, I don't know, we don't know exactly, but there's more and more whales out there. It's not causing the population to decline, okay? And that's what I wanted to point out there. We actually, right now, don't know the exact number of humpback whales. There are certain whales still, um, North, those North Atlantic right whales and the North Pacific right whales, still low numbers. Uh, there's certain populations of humpback whales that are low numbers. Okay, so this brings me to that entanglement response that I mentioned earlier, the broad scope of our response. It wasn't all about saving whales. It's about increasing awareness, Don said, you know, that uh, Petersburg Marine Mammal Center, and how much outreach and education they do. Very important, it's always the foundation. Public safety, I mentioned we have had people, even in cold Alaska waters, literally put the, the knife in their mouth and jump in the water to save a whale kind of thing. Um, so we don't want that to happen. Um, and then there's, we do like to save some whales. If, and we can't save them all, but if the conditions are right, it's safe, we've got the right resources, and the trains we've been doing the last couple of days are part of that, we'll do our best as a team. And then there's gathering information towards reducing the threat. That is big, and yet the data set's small. I mean, you saw the number of cases that we get called in, but each one of those is a little piece of information that we can figure out what's going on, where the gear came from, what it was, how was it set, whether fishing gear or not, to try to reduce the threat for everyone, whale and human beings. And there's my humpback whale taking a closer look at the, at the threat there. Okay. So, and again, I'm just gonna emphasize, our goal is not to go out and free every whale. It's, it, one, it's just foolish. And that became so apparent to us that we were calling our networks, you know, disentanglement network, and we were a disentanglement coordinator. We don't even do that anymore. Everything is entanglement response, entanglement coordinator, and that's just walking the, the walk or talk. Okay. So now, giving you that, giving you guys that background, I want to tell you how we actually do it. Okay. And again, this catch and release of sorts. Uh, you get a little hint there in the grapple hook. Okay. Okay, again, we've got a typically, not always, but typically a mobile whale. This is a mother with its yearling, came back to Hawaii. Okay. So yearlings are tangled in the mouth there. Okay. And so I mentioned earlier, what was going to say, yep, is that it's a whale technique or, the, or a fishing technique. I mean, the tuna uh, fishing fishing industry or there's other industries that will keg, keg their big fish, you know, you can build fish. Uh, but in this case, I went with the whale. I'm going to use the old Gregory Beck version of Moby Dick here. So, um, and basically, they harpooned a whale. Back then, they were attaching to a whale. Harpoons were not killing whales. It's kind of hokey, isn't it? But harpoons back then did not kill whales, just attaching to the animal. And then they got their name type of slave ride, as you saw in the wooden skiff. Okay, now if the whale dove, you got to let go. So they had these wooden barrels they attached to the line, and the whale tried to pull the, boat, the barrels down. And after a couple barrels, the whale get tired, stay the surface, and then there was this lance they had, you know, a long pole with a long blade, but that long, that would drive in and get to the vitals and bleed the whale out. That was the technique. The old, again, 1800s, uh, Moby Dick era kind of technique. Okay. So what we're going to do is tweak that a little bit. Instead of the harpoon, we're using a grapple hook. It's a grab grapple. It's actually, uh, I bought the first one at Chatham Marine. 
down in Cape Cod, a good, good throw in there, it was called a steak raffle. That's what, at least that's what they called it. It was two, two of those with a chain in between them for a fisherman to recover lost pots. So I bought a couple of them, cut the chain off, asked a welder to build me a handle, and that was our first grab grapple, was the snake grapple built in with a handle. So we started using it for well work, and you're going to see that over and over again. A lot of the tools we use ends up being fishing gear, or at least nautical gear, used for this purpose. So we got a hold of a whale. Instead of the wooden skiff we're using inflatables, it's got to be something small enough to, to tow behind. We're not showing off, by the way, we can do it on the trainings. You learn a lot when you're towing behind a whale. You feel the line as it's shifting, that you can feel the, the beat of the tail, how strong is the whale, and you're setting your hook back to our analogy of uh, fishing. You're setting the hook and you're playing the whale right away. In a sense, the boat you're on is your first kegging buoy. Just, you know, you're probably going to let go because you don't want to go down with the whale. So, okay, so that's what happens here. There's a Nantucket Sailor Eye, that's David Matilla and myself. So, and, and we're starting to add our kegging buoys as well. That is not part of the entanglement. That's, that's our buoys that we've snapped on. We're trying to get that well to slow down and tire out. Fortunately, in, in the breeding grounds, they're full of hormones, so it doesn't help us. Here's another shot here where some of that's the entanglement, some of that's we put buoys on. We're trying to walk our way up the line to get another buoy on, and we're going to get one on here. But you definitely, the whale wins the strength battle. I don't care how big the guy is, it's a 25 year old male, you know, at 6'4, he's not going to win that battle. So you add these kegging buoys, it might take a couple hours, but the whale will eventually slow down, stay at the surface, and then you can pull yourself up and make a cut, possibly. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, but if it takes three barrels, I got, I, got, I did what we did, I'm doing jaws now. Um, you know, and this look, by the way, that these guys have, you know, um, perfect, because every time, every case is different. People say, hey, write a manual, you can't. Because every one would be different. And it matters if you're on site. You, you learn something on site. And I'm always, these trainings that I do, I learn as much from people like Barry and Don and the gang as I'm trying to convey to them as well. There's that look. Have you ever had one do this before? <laughs> yep. Perfect. That quizzical look. Like, what, what the hell just happened? I think he says to him. Yeah. That's the look. <laughs> right there. Okay, but eventually, that's another way else, you know, and that's the Coast Guard, but you know, they're good Coast Guard and OLE, Office of Law Enforcement, other agencies, and fish, we've had fishing boats be our backup. Someone else is, is going to help you out. You work as a team. So, so the whales slow down, the actual entangled whales slow down, you can see that. So things are getting better. You know, it might take us a couple hours, but we're getting there. And then you can pull up behind the whale. This is older footage, by the way, but a um, different whale. But you get to a point where the whale hardly dives, and you pull up to where the entanglement is, do another assessment, figure out which, which tool I'm going to use, you know, and hopefully make the cuts to free the whale. I'm going to, we're going to move a kegging buoy a little closer to the animal. Those kegging buoys are good because they also restrict those tail slashes and things like that. So, Okay. And then you start pulling out the knives. And a lot of these are hook knives. Take advantage of the cats. Stall on the outside, sharp on the inside. And see that boat is there, just tow it. It's just like an anti slow drive. So one guy's holding the boat, the whale, that black line, we're holding on to it. And the other guy's got that knife trying to make cuts. You ready, By the way, the big patch, we put that on, it kind of wore through the bow after a couple times. Okay. Okay, so, let's see here. Okay, so what I wanted to mention here, and I'm going to try to sprinkle in some of the local efforts here. Because, Barry, I think we said, or Don, maybe nine or ten efforts you guys have had over the years. Like, that's, a, that's a great number of getting good team here. Um, this is one of them. But I want to point out, it's a very much a boat-based technique. So we're not, remember, we work under a permit, just like a fishing license. That's our fishing license. Um, and it says, thou shall not jump in the water. So we can't do that. And by the way, it doesn't work. Even Hawaii, with a clear water, um, it's, it usually don't get the whale free when you jump in. I don't see anyone. YouTube, when you see it on YouTube, Usually they're, the, they're animals that are almost dead. Um, and by the way, the whale's not going to come around and thank you either. You know, I wish they would. But they, <laughs> they don't think they're doing that, of course. But boat-based technique. It's all about boats, whether it's a big boat or a lot of times small flavors work well in many situations. And here's a poor guy. This guy, it, it, not a U.S. It, this was a, a Kiwi, a New Zealander. He was a fisherman. He was a diver. Uh, some whale watch boats had, uh, they knew he was a good diver. 
So they started finding entangled whales in New Zealand, North Island, and no, South Island, sorry, South Island. And um, they called him up and he had three, two humpback whales. So this third one comes along, whale watch boat again, calls him up, we've got an entangled whale, we'll stand by for you until you get here. The guy shows up, he dons his gear, gets in the water, he's working on the whale, and the whale does a spook response. Doesn't attack him, you know, it doesn't understand what's going on maybe, whatever, but does a little spook response and hits him in the head and kills him, unfortunately. So there's his monument there. So um, just to point out that the in-wire stuff just doesn't work. So um, techniques, similarities do not go there. Uh, and back to dangerous, that's uh, west coast here, you know, California. Um, so again, the whole thing is you've got to be careful. Uh, it is a big fish, is what it really comes down to. You've got to make sure you play it accordingly, read the behaviors, know when to reel it in and when not to. So, all right. And then back to the authorization. Our, again, fishing permit is the, is the authorization from NOAA Fisheries, the lead agency uh, for at least the U.S. And, and that's Dave Matilla, a little older now. Um, I, he hates this picture, I think. He's uh, put a little weight on by this time. But he's, he's got his hand out doing something. It looks like he's saying, stop. Only certain people should do this. So. And that's why I show it. Yeah. OK. So what I'm going to do now is just give you some more cases, just run through, and um, there'll be some different hooks and different poles and different ways in our uh, analogy here with the fishing industry. This is uh, another uh, youngster, another juvenile, tangled around the tail. Tends to be a little easier when you get them wrapped around the tail because you can stay behind them and, and don't have to reach too far up. Okay? I think this will be easy to grab from him. So we got, using our grab grapple, our old snake grapple. He's, here he comes up. And it's sort of inflatable here. There's the throw, so casting out. You want to cast accurately just over the line. And then our our little, it's a telemetry buoy, a tag buoy in this case, but we'll, it's kegging still. Okay, get that over. Whales almost always dive right away, so let them go. Let them start tying themselves out. Okay. And then here we're doing our Nantucket sleigh ride. And this, again, youngsters are full of piss and vinegar, especially down there, pumped up in hormones. It's the breeding time. So even the humpback whales get, uh, they don't want to stop. So I think we're, yeah. We can't wear ourselves out, I said. So and that's smart. So, yeah, the whales always win that if you don't heed that. So actually, it was two days it took us to free this whale. First day, we lost connections five times. Uh, it caught one of the support boats and dragged its stern to wrong way on the Nantucket sleigh ride. And the second day, uh, after a two-day storm, we got we got back to it, and the whale was totally different. You know, we're keeping our distance and we're making cuts. There's two cuts coming up. One, two. I think that's the last two cuts actually. And then the gear shed from the wounds and the whale is free. So after all that, it was like ten seconds and the whale is free. But it pays off to be methodical. That's a and I don't know fishing's pretty methodical in its way as well. So then, it, then this is a female, adult female. This is just a couple years ago. Um, it was off the big island and the teams there tagged it and had five wraps around the tail, so giving the easy ones again, relatively speaking. And uh, we got kegged it down, still going a good four or five knots. There's the team from the inflatable and poles with the knives on the end. So here's going to be one cut. I'm going to show you. I won't show you everything here. I'm going to be somewhat abbreviated. There's the hook knife, boom. There's one cut made there. Took a couple more cuts. See, I can show you helmet cam footage and pole cam footage, especially with Hawaii's clear waters. Maybe why I gravitate a little bit towards Hawaii here. I'm um, showing you stuff, but there's the last cut being made and a little explosion of tissue from the wounds um, and the last wrap coming off. And I'm sure this whale will do fine. I mean, those wounds are not that deep. Um, it's the kind of thing we hope to see these whales again, but there's so many whales it actually works against us as far as getting a recite on the animal. Right. And then here's a little different, mount entanglement, and it's like a bridle over the back, and that is the wrong way to do a rescue. Okay, we're sitting on top of the whale, trying to cut it, it's a big line, and you're going, well, I hope the whale doesn't mind me being here, because if it doesn't, <laughs> it's not good. So we started developing uh, what's called, we call it the flying knife, and it just slips off the end of the pole, so here it is. There's the bridle, same whale, just got smarter. And there it is, the knife's on, on the bridle. Now you can just back out, just let some line out, get behind the whale, bend it over the valley inflatable, and just use your inflatable's force 
just bouncing along, whale's kicking his tail, the ocean's bobbing, cut is made in maybe 10 minutes. I think I actually put my camera in the water, and the knife was already halfway through, so some big gauge line there. So, it's really methodical in that regard. Want to keep people, want to keep us safe too, keep others safe. Um, then this is another juvenile um, yearling, about 38 feet long, uh, another mouth entanglement, polyline this time at least. Yeah, here's the, one of the grapple throws on it. We had to grapple it twice. So this is it and the companion. It's close. So I'm going to throw it right over the line. And we're in a bigger boat now, so we've got to be careful we're not going to throw our gear in the water too fast or the captain's not going to be happy with us. So we're running the line out. We caught our fish. We're paying the line out. You know, and when the big boats you're using your hands is like the star drag, but in the inflatable, you get to use the bow as your star drag. You bend it all for harder, you got a harder, you, it's like tightening up your star drag on your reel. You let a little loose, it'll come up, climb up on the spots in, and it's like you loosen your star drag. So you, it really is, it's got some similarities with fishing. Okay. okay, and then here's that again. The same way I'm trying to stay with whales now. Now what we've done is, the guy on the port side is holding our whale, or the boat position, the guy on the starter side of the pole, just put a hook knife on that bridle, and release the knife, and has a line in his right hand. The guy on the port, we want him to let go of his line. We want the knife line to be tight now. Okay. So we're just clearing things up a little bit, and the guy on the right has that small, it's probably blue steel or American steel or poly steel line, which has a knife on the end. And again, about 10 minutes later, the, the line was cut. And sometimes you get lucky, you cut it clean, and you pull from the other side, and it'll pull through the mouth. Mouth entanglements can be tricky because they have those baleen racks and sometimes things like a knot or a buoy can get jammed up in there and then you have to just trim both sides and hope the whale is like, you know, uses his tongue. It's like getting some food out between your teeth or something. So, okay. Oh, and there's the knife. So I just, just showing you, uh, Coast Guard took a picture. They were our support team again in this case. And you see the knife on the right side of the knot on the top of the, the youngster there. Okay, then I want to point out, we're realizing, boy, I, I couldn't wait. I remember the first time I went shopping for carbon fiber poles, they were like, they wanted like $10,000 for a bunch of poles. I was like, forget this, I don't have that kind of budget. But now they're down to like 700, 800. In fact, for a while there, sailboard masks, especially in Hawaii, I could get used sailboard masks. People would give them to me for a couple hundred dollars. And you could put a couple of them together, pair them up and get maybe 24 feet of pole. You know, now I get like 35 feet of pole, you know. So you can really reach, and with that reach, you can start using larger boats. It's starting to expand our capabilities here. Didn't need the inflatable all the time, maybe. So here I'm showing you a reach from a larger boat. Now I'm going to show you the video of this one. It's just cruising along, reaching out. Depth perception becomes an issue. Yep, there you go. And then it comes right to me after all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good job, guys. That's a nice one, That's an easier one, because that way. And then we've also had, in Hawaii, you get, the cats are really small. I mean, small is like a ton and 15 feet long, still pretty big. Uh, but we've got some entanglements. Um, a lot of it's marine debris and things of that nature. There's mom and calf. We've had some difficulties with the cats because they are small enough. Mothers are very protective, especially down there and somewhat around here. Um, that has been a challenge to do them. And our original knives here, yeah, pull one out, didn't work very well. Because I don't know if you guys know, the mother's milk is like yogurt. I mean, it's like 50% milk fat. Calves grow very quickly. I mean, literally one day later, the line just disappears. And you're fearful that it's cutting. So far, it's always just been pinched, okay? But our, our regular knives were drawn the outside, and we were just bouncing over. We could never get hooked in. And especially the calf is up for a brief time, and again, mom would cut us off. So we were having some challenges. Um, and there's one of the ones which we're getting it. See the line is indented in the, what is really just an indentation now. So here's uh, Grant Thompson trying to get in, one of my team in Hawaii, trying to get in there with that knife. Just not happening. So he, he went and built another knife. Ace Hardware, here it is. Here's his original knife. Uh, Ace Hardware, it's a bamboo knife. And he just sharpened both sides up, shaped it a little bit for me, and I mounted it up. And so we're going to use it and on our next calf. Okay. And here it is. It's, I, mean, I think there's two clips here. What we had to do, and we're, we trained for this, look for behavioral changes too that might help you. Well, mothers 
sometimes will go to depth and rest at about 60 feet down. And they can hold their breath for like about 20, 25 minutes. The calf cannot. Calves hold their breath three to five minutes. So you can get the calf by itself a couple times before mom comes up. So we just kept nudging the boat up, and then we see the calf, oh, it's too far away, nudge it up after it went back down, and got in position. It might have taken a while, I don't remember how long it took, but we finally got in position. So I think the next video clip is going to show, show you that. There's the calf, <clears throat> just a little too far, but it got curious. I think it, this next rise is it's going, what is that? And it comes up again, and there's the cut right there. So. And I think it goes so fast, a little bit of blood. Remember, we sharpen the knife on both sides to get in and get that line. Okay. And by the way, we did not recover that gear. Remember back to gaining information? Part of that is getting the gear back, right? Well, getting it out of the ocean, too. But figuring out what it was. It exploded off of the cap. It was so tight that it just exploded off and we never found it. But there was a frame in the camera that got it for us on the pole, and it was some kind of monofilament. Okay. Uh, there's a shot from the boat helm showing the cut being made. Okay. And then this calf stayed around for like a month and people started naming it. One harbor called it Hulu and another harbor called it Ringer. So it was a very happy whale, a very curious whale, which might have helped us on our rescue. Okay. And then here's uh, another juvenile humpback whale. It's in Long Line. This is a uh, tuna Long Line north of the islands. So between us here in Alaska and Hawaii. Um, this is nasty stuff when they get in it. Uh, it's, it's so strong and so narrow, it cuts easily into the animal. Okay, so a little rougher day. And we've got this cutting grapple. It's a grapple with blades in it. So it's the kind of stuff that we can't tag. We can't, you don't want to pull on this stuff. You don't want to even touch it. And he's, Jason Moore's going to, so then another just person's done the training and got some experience. And just clean everything off behind the animal. Okay. Now what we'd like to do is get the wraps, but we've now got it in a position where there's nothing trailing, so we feel good about running our boat next to the whale, because we won't catch anything in our props. Okay, okay so a bunch of gear. Now we're just going to, with a good captain, and somewhat of a quality, there's the shark bites by the way, and you just keep trying to catch up to the whale, and just reach out and hook it a couple times, just rehooking the whale, so to speak, and hooking lines on it. So little by little, we got all the wraps off of it. And then when we're done, we let it be. And I think that animal will do okay. Yeah, at one point the sharks went after it, but I think that's minor. I've seen much worse. All right. Then I just took you a, that last swipe. That's what we got. So that's a frame grab from the video that shows we got three wraps there on that one, on that sweep. Okay. And that's a picture afterwards. A diver. Um, a couple days later, well, swimming right by him. He had his camera. I think it all was pissed his pee his pants. Sorry. Um, but um, he got a picture of it, and that's the way I Just little pieces in the wounds, no wraps, but little pieces coming off. So, and then this year, we had a, a mountain tank whale, this is it, and here's our assessment. We come up, and, and um, I thought it was great in mine. You know, I thought that's what we were looking at here. And so we were pulling out the knives and trying some things. Uh, here's cutting grapple throw. Let's see if I can make a cut below it. So I'll get that grapple and play, and then we cast out. Yeah, nice. So just trying to catch your whale or fish in that regard, okay? Didn't work, uh, and in the end we found out it was cable. Uh, and this is a good message point, good, it was a learning lesson for me, is don't ever make assumptions, right? I've already learned my lessons, no, it's not always fishing gear, but boy, this was the epitome of that. This is a 850 feet of coaxial cable, and we have a sample going around here somewhere. Oh, the duck bear's got it. Um, and that was a new one. We did, not, I, we did not have a knife in the toolkit for that. So uh, lifeguards, my missus, ran to Ace Hardware again, and she bought the only set of uh, bolt cutters they had on the shelf. She ran down to the lifeguards. Lifeguards jet skied it out to us, and here's the cut being made. I think this was video. So, and the whale pissed off at us by this time. So the team's like on, you'll hear him. The one guy's got the bolt cutters going, I made one cut, but can we get closer? And I'm like, no, let's call it. That's good enough. Let's not get anyone get hurt. Not worth it. So that's a one cut. Yeah, that, that's we can't get any closer, Lee. Okay. The guy on the right is a fisherman, the guy in the middle that made a cut is a whale watch captain. And the, and the woman on the left is 
no accords with professional mariner. And that's actually occurred to me. There's your equation. There's your three people with the different expertise coming into play. And I'm in the back of the boat just watching at this point. Okay. Well, there you go. Don? Yep. So Don mentioned this earlier. Um, and I'm just going to run through, again, it's like 10 cases. I was not here, so I'm not going to go into any detail. And I'm sure Barry and Don, Sonny and the gang and Scott would tell you more about these cases over the years, but just an introduction. This was one of the toughest ones that I've, I've seen. Uh, the case, excuse me, a lot of gill net entanglements when they occur are kind of very polarized. Sometimes it's clean punch throughs with very little gear involved, but sometimes when the whales panic and twirl up, it gets more involved. That's a case like this. And they were able to get the whale free, and then, ah, Barry and I, back in 06, uh, first time working with Barry here, he had a whale entangled up uh, Lower Stevens. I was able to join him and bring a, we were just starting, I only had like one, one tag package in Alaska at the time. Met him up, we tagged it, and over the, over the next 10 days, we got the whale free. It just took us a couple tries. So, um, Juvenile Gray Whale, Ideal Cove, uh, 2011. Pittsburgh, they're just not too long, no, 2011. Is that the same one, though? Yes. Same one. Same, same one. Sorry. Yep. But, oh, and it's, so it's Sonny and Bob right there right. working right. together. So, <clears throat> biologists and fishermen again. So there's your equation. So, okay. Then more recently, right, Don? This is Sonny and you, I believe. This is two, last year, year four. This is, uh, oh, this is right outside the Narrows, I believe. And then the whale ran up Federick. We ended up tagging it. Yep. So, yep. Okay. This whale was a unique case in that we think in, in investigating this, I think, the, I think the whale had something wrong with its tail. It, it, that tail was crooked. That wasn't just like a, a still grab where it was switching a tail and it just happened to catch it crooked. It was a crooked tail. And it had backbone issues. And that might have, just as we said, you can have a whale get entangled and get hit by a boat, or actually you can have a whale hit by a boat and the scars make it more prone to get entangled. Well, you can have a whale, I think that's what happened here, I think this whale got hit, and it was weaker, and when it tried to punch through the net, maybe, it couldn't, so it ended up getting entangled, so, just a theory, you don't, well, you never really know. A little bit about these techniques, though, is that, so far, what we're going with is what's worked. If, some, if something doesn't go well, well, we learn our lesson, we take it as a mistake, and we... We adjust, okay, but proven techniques for the most part, remember, 1,400 so far, and by the way, no one's, not from wood, no one's been killed from that effort, there's been some dislocated fingers and some pit, some cuts and knife cuts, little minor things, so far, so it's working, we're going with it. Um, much of the experience from, again, from the fishermen and the whale lodges, kind of a lot of input there, and, and historically speaking as well, involves minimal direct contact with the whale, therefore minimizing the risk. We're really trying to keep people safe here as well. That's one of those big goals. So respecting the animal. Yeah, I'm talking a lot. I was giving you the network effort, the network effort, right? And it involves fishermen. But again, realizing that fishermen, they're like, a lot of times they're right there. They're the forefront, right? They're out there on the water, whether it's their gear or not, um, to do disentanglements themselves. So sick of sound in March, they're cutting a humpback whale free, okay? Okay, and that's totally, by the way, if it's their gear, that's, that falls under the fishing permit. They're allowed totally, remember how I said we have to work under a permit, not just not allowed to just go out and rescue whales, we have to call in and get our permissions. Fishermen under their license are allowed to cut whales free if it's their gear. So I'm pointing that out as well. Okay. Part of that license. Now I do have a cautionary note, and that is fishermen love their boats. I'm going to show that twice, okay? I don't know if you can see what happened there. But the biggest tool a fisherman has is the boat, the hydraulics, and a lot of fishermen when they're dealing with an entangled whale. We'll try to winch it up to the boat, try to pull it in, pot hauler or winch, and they'll get it beside the boat. They think, well, I can really work on it now. Whales have a tendency to not like getting, well, well, or being over constrained. And, and it happens about one whale length from the boat, okay? So about 40 feet. That's about their limit. That's their comfort zone. And it seems like many times when I've seen the videos or I've seen it myself, you get them any closer to that and they freak out. And that's what this whale does. He's trying to pot haul it in. He's got his up over to boom, block and tackle. And once the whale starts to strain, that line just gives and almost nails the guy at the, the controls there. Let's make back up and play that one more time. It happens fast. You hear it more than anything. You see the whale's getting too close. There it goes. He definitely jumps back. So, so it's dangerous is what I'm getting. And I'm trying to tell, trying to tell him, boy, don't punch it too close. You're going to do something like that. So, 
Okay, and retrieving gear. So again, we don't save every whale, but if we can get to the gear and figure out what it was, and maybe actually, I know that you just hauled in some gear, and maybe you know, I'm, hopefully I'm not putting you on the spot, but you were telling me the other day what you figured out that what this was, right? After yeah, that, quite a bit of investigation. That was a young uh, gray whale that was first spotted on Ideal Cove, and then we uh, went out to look for it the next morning. It was right over by uh, Saspi Island. <laughs> we went down and followed it down into uh, Scow Bay, and released it down by Mountain Point. But the, the gear that was on it was a uh, large mesh gill net, but it was kind of purple in color and had the hard plastic floats. And we thought that it had probably come from Mexico, but it turned out it, after about a year and a half, we tracked it down to a small Vietnamese uh, white bass fishery off of Ventura, California. <laughs> yep. so, I mean, we just kept kept asking people, what, yep. what is this gear type? And sending it around to different people that recognized it, and finally we got a hit. People don't realize that's where most of this effort lies. You know? Yeah, the, the rescue side can be dramatic. Um, it shouldn't be, but it can be, and people focus on that. But the focus really should be a back to entertainment response on what Barry just described. The work is involved in trying to figure out connecting the dots. I call it connecting the dots. So. Okay. And I'm just going to give a little bit on how we're doing. Again, those are some of the efforts, some of the teams, different places. A couple of images there showing the Petersburg team. Okay. And that also shows where some of the reports are coming in. And those little circles, those, uh, sorry, the kind of transparent yes, mustard colored circles, are where we've kind of tried to place gear and, and found the right people, the right equation of people. So, so we have some effort in those areas. But you can see the little dots. Now those are where the reports come in. That's not where the entanglement occurred. I can actually, some of those dots occurred on, on the western Pacific side. The animals swam across, or from Hawaii, and swam back up to Alaska. And it also points out that we get a lot of reports, but not every report is it confirmed as an entangled whale. See, certain percentage loss there. I did throw in some whales that have gone to, from Alaska to Hawaii, the 211 number. Okay. So, again, there's Fair numbers there, okay, not, but at the same time, not that big. We've mounted over 210 responses as a big team, the overall network effort. That's excluding what fishermen independent might do. 65 whales have been either partially or fully free. That's Alaska and Hawaii. Count kind of them together because we're, we're a big team. We actually share gear and things like that. Same whales for the most part, so I consider it one big team. Okay, and over 20,000 feet of gear removed, 125 sets of gear identified. Again, they're data points. They're, that can help us, all of us, get the truth. And um, people ask, like, okay, why does it happen, Ed? Well, here's a humpback row, by the way. Sometimes the whales are focusing on the gear, okay? So it's intentional. There's a, if it's focused on the prey or on the target species, it's called depredation. Or it might be just playing with the gear or rubbing along it. It's a way to get some barnacles or some parasites off of you. Here's a juvenile. This is um, pinfalls right in the hatch, and they release their, their salmon. And here comes the humpback whale, and take a mouthful of salmon you've just raised. That's a big deal. Okay, I think it's a, a lot of money that goes down to help it run. So that's got to be ahead. And so I'm putting that in different class because that's the whale focused on the gear in that regard. So it's definitely different mind than my mom. Okay. Then you have stumblers. Okay. And then Jan's let me use this at times. Okay. This is some from her studies working with the fishermen. This is long line outside of Sitka. The clicking is a sperm whale coming along targeting. This is depredation. Okay, so you have a little, uh, you have a lot less sympathy for the whale in this case, and more sympathy for the fisherman. So. Getting close. Sorry, I should have edited it more. <laughs> it's coming on us. <laughs> I there it is. Okay. It's very dramatic footage. Yeah, okay, so he lays his lower jaw there and he's pinging off the fish. I mean, the fish are going to knock his head against the gunnel there. Yeah. So, yep. And, if, and other species do this. Orcas out further to the west and, and pilot whales have done it and false killers. And, it, and it's a learned behavior. So one year you've got one pod doing it, the next year there's three. And boy. So there's a, a definitely a whole different. Um, issue there we've got to deal with. Okay. And then there's the stumblers, you know, whales don't see the gear, it's cryptic, or they're paying attention to feeding and they, they run into it, things of that nature. Inexperienced, we think that's big. And we were 
Don and Barry and I were discussing the fact that sometimes openings where you haven't been fishing a given area for a while and the whales weren't used to the gear and suddenly that fishery opens up and I think I think it's like the first couple of days you get lots of entanglements and no one knows what it is. It's like, where's my gear? It was here the other day, now it's gone. And it takes us a week, months before we pick some of those animals up, we find some of them. And again, remember, some of them are gonna throw the gear a day later, that kind of thing happens as well. So, um, yep, so there's, if they're, not, they're not targeting gear is what I'm getting at here. It's, just, it's a mistake, okay? A lot of youngsters, and here's some of the data on that, lots of juveniles. Uh, you start, even in Alaska, you start getting the calves. They start to get more independent from mom. Remember, they only stay with their mother a year. So, uh, some values there. Okay. Overall, small numbers. Remember, it takes a while. Okay. And then here's some gear types. What you're going to notice here is everything. I mean, I, could, I throw the kitchen sink in there. Not always fishing gear. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I've had three hydrophone arrays listening to humpback whales sing it in tank of whales. Okay. <laughs> you gotta, remember, the, I was passing that communications cable around, you know, so there's other sort of things here, but what it tends to be is fixed gear, gear that's set and left, not the mobile stuff, not, a, not an auto troll on that that's going to catch a fit or catch a, a whale, it tends to be the set stuff that's set and left, okay, in that regard, and again, whether they don't see it or they're, or they're um, playing with it, and by the way, they do play with the gear, fishermen were telling me that early on, and I was like, oh, come on, guys, they're not playing with the gear, they play with the gear, so. Um, and then in Hawaii, we've got a couple cases where the whales have dragged the gear down to Hawaii. We've had it the other way around, too, not as often. But here's something I want to point out. As scientists, sometimes you've got to look out for the biases. And here's a big bias or, or challenge. A lot of the gear that we're finding in Hawaii is the big Bering Sea stuff. Okay? You know, they're not dragging the 700-pound pot down with them. We've had them drag the corner post. They broke the wells and carry the, web, the two bars down, okay, and figure it out. But that gear is made to be robust. It's made to handle the Bering Sea. And it's got a polyball this big with big numbers on it. Is that going to help me investigate or, or figure out where it came from and what it is? Yes. So we've got it, yeah, as scientists, that's part of the equation too, is figuring out not only what it is, but the differences and challenges. A lot of the Hawaiian gear coming up here, sponge X buoys. The whale's diving, there's sponge egg buoys, and a day or two later, they're crumbling up to pieces, they're crushing, they fall apart, and we have no buoy, no license number or anything like that, and it's just a piece of line. It goes into the unknown category in almost all cases. So those are some of the challenges we're up against, and okay, help everyone. So what's our success? Um, hitting all potentially useful gear up to the whale, minimal injuries to the animal, no injuries to us on the human side, we want to get some documentation, get the information, get the data, um, and if you can also get the gear out of the water, that's a bonus for everyone. So I know um, uh, a couple years ago, I, we cut a whale free, and, and there was a guy from Wrangell, and he helped me out. He told me what it was, even while we were working on the whale. He got to me right away, and so I knew what we were dealing with. We got the gear off, and we sent it back to him, and I think he still got it on his garage door in Wrangell there. So it says he has a plaque that says, been to a wagon back. <laughs> And here's just letting you know, in general, how people can help. Because it, even though there are permits and things like that, there's still many roles to play. Like if you're out in the water and you come across an entangled whale, again, as rare as it might be, um, there's a hotline number. And if, you, if someone gets back to you right away and you're still <coughs> in the vicinity, you might ask, hey, can you stay around? But stay a safe distance. Get some pictures. Start getting the information. But again, stay a safe distance. The, the thing about whales is, one, it's all dangerous. And they might run over towards your boat and you get your Nantucket sleigh ride in all the wrong way but they, they'll only give us so many approaches. They get tired of you after a while coming up close to them. You know, they don't like it. So we want to save some of those approaches if the team, let's say it is up near Petersburg and Don and Barry and the gang are all coming um, to respond, don't do too many approaches. And we can't deputize you in that regard anyway. But the best thing you do is call in. And if you don't have a cell phone signal, Coast Guard relay on 16. Here's the hotline. And, uh, Boy, last slide, sort of, in the sense that I, there's so many people to thank that you almost, you had to group them up. Um, so I've done like nonprofits or fishermen, things like that, because I couldn't name everyone. But um, a lot of different organizations and the community, as I started to say in the beginning, or I did say, the community, it's really been about, it's a community-based effort in that regard. And then we got, I had to get Sonny and Bob in there again. Um, this is training. 
They didn't just cut the well-free, but they cut the simulated entangled well-free, and Sonny is celebrating um, there. And so, so anyway, it's there. And so um, thank you guys. Oh, oh, mahalo is thank you in Hawaii, sorry. And mahalo. And if you guys have any questions, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, when you picked up all that cable, it seemed like that picture was very close to the top. Uh, it was. Did, it, did you report something like that right away to them, or or how we, did all that work? Yep, so it was close to shore, mm -hmm. um, and it was a beach where all the tourists were, and there was stand-up boards and everything going on. So first, Coast Guard, I called the Coast Guard right away, and they did our perimeter, keeping people safe, remember? Uh, and then they had to leave on a SAR. Remember, Coast Guard's primary role is not whale rescue. So they did the appropriate thing. They left for a SAR mission. It was okay. Then I asked the, since it was so close, the lifeguards came out and with the jet skis maintained the perimeter. It was the lifeguards later that we said, oh crap, we need a cape boat cutter. They did the relay for us from the shoreline. So, so we will have uh, support boats that help us, but support boats to keep people safe. And then I was worried, that was one reason why I also wanted that well free right away. Like, I was like, gosh, do we pull up and try to maybe get a little closer? But the whale was starting to thrash, it was starting to go inshore, and I was like, we just need to cut this well free and let it get swim away from people. Because even as much as you try to get tourists away, they're still coming up on their stand up board going, what are you doing? You know? And, yeah, so, you know, public safety. Good question. But I'll, I also wondered then about that cable. Were they saying that this is something that had just been laid and it Ah, oh, gotcha. So on the How investigation side, it wasn't around there. Okay. Um, it seemed like it was a fairly recent entanglement from the condition of the animal. But what we think it was, and I'm going to cut right to the chase here, is we think it was a fat, uh, that fish aggregating device. We think someone grabbed it from the, from the dome. It was old. By the way, the cable was, hasn't been used since 2000 okay, uh, in Hawaii. And it probably wasn't legal cable in the sense because it didn't have any writing on it. Uh, U.S. had demand, you know, we state that you have to put the codes and things like that on the, on the casing of the cable. So those are just some of the hints of some of the investigation we did. In short, the best theory we have, and we can't prove it, I don't know for sure, is that a fisherman, a local fisherman, had gone to the dump and had grabbed what he could find, and a lot of them do that, and they, they hang it below like a raft material, and it creates an ecosystem which small schooling fish come to. And then you go out and you fish it for mahi and tuna and things like that. And it's become very popular in Hawaii. We've seen a lot a lot more of it. Um, so it's part of the fishing techniques that they have at hand. And I think this whale, young, yes, young whale with that one, probably got to playing with the gear, got in its mouth, and then ran off with it. And we have to find it probably only about a week later. It wasn't, hadn't been dragging it that long. So yep, that's a theory. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you when you cut that cable, yep. you basically a, a small portion of it was still in the whale. True, exactly. We had been earlier we had been pulling on it and it was not budging. I mean we had put the boat in gear and, and basically we were starting to tow the whale. And when you start to tow the whale, you're going, Well that's it. You know, it's and it was when we got a closer look, it had kinked a little bit. So it come out of the mouth and where it had it had dragged around. In fact the first day it was a different location than the second day. It went about five miles uh, with that gear. So with that tow of 850 feet and dragging across reefs at time, it had kinked the cable over the back of the corner's mouth. So that made it tough for us to pull. And again, because it was starting to get pissed off at us, we made a decision we're going to cut. So we left about 50 to 60 feet, we believe, on the whale. Now, I've done that with lines, and not all cases, but many cases, we've been able to find the animal again, and it's, it's gotten rid of the gear. Okay, but a cable, I don't know. It's totally, I can only find three cases worldwide of, an, of a whale, uh, of this type of cable, by the way, that for a while there in the 60s and the 70s, they were getting caught in these power, the transatlantic cables and things like that. And some scientist in New Zealand, the guy in New Zealand that wrote a paper on it, called me up and said, you know, he was, he was telling me I wrote, a, I wrote my thesis on this, you know, back then. So, um, yeah, it's rare still. And, yeah, we tried. Public, yeah, human safety comes first. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good to see you again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the training that you're doing now and, and oh, just maybe true. some of the Southeast trainings you've done yeah. lately? And yeah. um, I saw the hotline up there, and I, 
that looks like the same hotline that, that that's, fishermen have, but yeah, that's but the, maybe the newer of, one, right? Yep, that's yeah, the better one. But maybe um, what we should do, like what's the protocol now okay. for calling these guys? Or gotcha. Hotline. And that's that's perfect. Good point. You don't have to call the hotline if you know <laughs> Sunny and Barry and Don. That's totally. I mean, if you guys don't mind, but that's <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it just, just blew it now. <laughs> If you don't mind calling them, if, if anything, if they can't respond, remember, these, it's like the volunteer fire company, but it's different in the sense that they're not always going to be able to respond. Okay? But they will, they can at times. They're going to they're gonna evaluate. Okay? There'll be times where they can, times where they can't, but that's a, an okay avenue, because if they can't, remember, we still want the, the data point, and maybe another team could, and things of that nature, or maybe a week later. Okay, so there's that avenue, there's the hotline, but it varies. I guess he give you a real good example of that, Cynthia, is that, that time that uh, Maury got caught up by Point Frederick late at night, it was almost dark, mm -hmm. and he called me at home. And he says, I got a whale in my net, I can't get him loose, I've tried everything, what do I do? So we were able to walk him through it. And he did exactly right. He lived in he did a 4A polyball on the end of the net, cut it off about fifty feet from the from the whale, yeah. left that on there. And we went out and found the, the whale the next day and you know, finished the job. So uh, safety first. You know, he, he was drifting toward the beach, and but by making a local phone call and just be able to walk him through it and just say this is this is the best situation in this at this time, and then and you don't have to go out and, and right. endanger yourself or endanger mm -hmm. the other person. It's just a, a lot of it's common sense. Right. So um, I guess. So I'm working for the Gilnet Association mm -hmm. these days, and is there some, so it's a Southeast organization, so is there some way I could get names and phone numbers of potential people that anyone fishing in the Southeast could call for various, like if you're in Juneau, you call these people, and if you're in Peterborough, oh, you call these so people. Oh, so like some of the locals, mm -hmm. some of the local network members for each community, right, yes. is what you're saying? Yeah. Well, we probably could do that. I would argue too the hotline is a good avenue okay. because here's why, and I remember trying to get this set up for the community here in Alaska. Yeah. Boy, that was probably 2008, I think it was, or 2007. Because what was I was hearing was someone would have an tangle whale and they would call if they were trying to call the government folks. You know, if it was Friday afternoon by three o'clock, they were gone, right? You know, for the weekend. But the way the hotline works is they do all the calling for you. You call that number and you give them the information and your number, they do all the work of calling down the tree, and, and they know the community, so it's like a central <laughs> dispatch, right? And they go, oh, it's near Petersburg. You know, they try the government people, they try the, the local network people, they can find you someone, and then once they find you someone, since you've given them your name and number, they'll call you back get the details, you know, and, and either we'll talk you through something or say, no, no, uh, Let's just do this and we'll, we'll go out tomorrow. Or it's even to the degree of it's not life threatening. It sounds like you just got to drape a gear over a flipper. Probably it'll throw it tomorrow. That kind of thing has happened with me. And, you, you know, the people care. That's, that's you know, I, I, everyone. I've, it's been Joe Public, it's been a fisherman. You, you can tell that they really care about the animal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, well, I didn't finish. I was going to say on our uh, trainings, you know, um, you know, I come in up, come up once in a while, lend a hand, okay, and we review stuff, and I'm in a position where I, I'm doing it as well, somewhere else, and I'm learning at the same time, and I'm hearing it from other people too. I'm tapped into the other countries that are doing this now, we've trained other countries. So I, I kind of look at myself as a little bit of a central repository, I take it all in, it helps me, and then I come up here and I regurgitate out and I share, and of course, they're sharing with me. They say, hey, we had this whale last year, and this new tool works, and, I, and again, it's cross dialogue, so we're learning from each other. So we do that. We have we do a like, classroom component, and then we go out and simulate too. We we tow some line behind a boat and make the approaches and throw the grapples. And it's giving us some familiarization with what it's really doing. So when the day comes, you go, I can throw this far, and I know what it feels like to pull behind a pull behind something at five knots because I've done it before. So it takes some of the other variables away. Just one. 40 ton whale is one heck of a variable. It really is. Does so that answer your other parts again? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and we can I didn't want to move I didn't want to move on until I finished your questions. Okay. Have you thought about tagging the animal or tracking it with radio transmitter or something to follow Exactly. Uh, we do that exactly. Um, I did cut a corner, didn't mention that, but 
The team here has a transfer package. It's GPS based as well. So, and um, so if they can't, if it's not safe, it's too late in the day, it's too rough, they don't have all their team. All the team wasn't there yet, but they're flying in the next day. Those are exactly the reasons you tag, and then you know where your big needle is out in that big haystack. And you can, and then you pick your time of day. You pick your, you pick, uh, oh, it's sunny weather tomorrow, but the next day it's gonna be nice. And hopefully the whale is in that good spot. I'm also thinking about the follow-up regarding the cable. If you left 60 feet of cable, it would, might be helpful ah, to follow-up to know that Yep. Yeah, we contemplated it, but when we had pulled on it and it hadn't done anything, and again, I was starting to worry about it getting too close to shore and all that, so I didn't, I didn't tag. Uh, and it would have ended up right, the tag would have been right at the tail and all that too, from where I cut it. So uh, I chose to go for the hope that it would get that last little bit out. Yeah. Yeah. So. It'd be interesting to know the survival. We hope to see that whale again, and my best chance was the next couple of days after we cut it free. But we got no reports. Very healthy whale, by the way. It wasn't. I don't think it was going to die anytime soon by any means. Uh, but it might. It was late enough in the season. Remember, whales coming and going from Hawaii anytime back to Alaska, back to feeding grounds. So it could have just said, "Hey, that's good. That's a load off. You know, I'm no longer dragging 800 and something feet. You know, I'm only dragging 50 feet." And it made a uh, run for Alaska, and as far as we know, it could be up here, feed, maybe hopefully feeding, you know, so, mm -hmm. yep. yep. First time she opens her mouth for a big bite, it's yeah. gone. <laughs> right, right, maybe, maybe. And that's, that's the big impact of starvation, yeah, that's a big one for the whales. Yeah. Well, there's some tools up here, by the way, as well, that you're welcome to take a look at. Um, by the way, the knives are sharp, so don't do a test, okay? Um, there's a few here, a few different devices. It's like part of a mobile kit, and um, a couple of other things here. This is a, one of the pingers, the noise alert devices, that some fish are testing to see if this might alert a whale to the gear to avoid it, to avoid entanglement. So one, they call it banana pinger. Um, then, uh, oh, with the, with the sperm whales, out of Sitka, Jan Straley and the fishermen working together, this is one technique, I don't think it worked entirely, but using a, a bead on the gangents next to the hooks, and this affects the echolocation. So it sort of blinded them in a sense. Mm -hmm. they, it gave them a strong echo, and like, whoa, you know, so where's the sable fish? So in that regard, they were trying to confuse the whales. Mm -hmm. Simple little thing, that's what you need, simplicity. You know, scientists tend to come up with things like a fat, soluble line. So when the whale gets entangled and gets into the blubber, the line will dissolve. That's not simple. <laughs> Let me, I'll just, there's worse examples than that. You need the fishermen to give you, ground you a bit in that regard. They're, they tend to be more prudent and, and know their cost effectiveness at all. But here's, here's a good example. The, I went to a workshop in New England last spring, a year ago, and the fishermen came up with this Chinese finger, right? They were designing these uh, and using these as weak links. They were going to, lobster fishermen down East Maine were going to use these. I shouldn't do this, by the way, because I'll be in trouble, right? Um, and just use something like this to make a little weak link in their line that would, of course, something like this is definitely weak, that was strong enough to haul their gear up with, that would get weaker and weaker over time, so they have to replace it every once in a while, but easy to replace, and, you know, cut and pull off and then put another one on. That's simplicity. And then and going to, I'm going to end with that one on my example of you got to have the fishermen at the table. You know, they're... They're part of the solution, and that's my example right there. So you can't get any better than that. And thank you guys again. Thank you, thank you Don. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you.